Let me just try to share my screen there. Um, Oh, that is weird. Um, I don't, I even lost my uh, Zoom, uh, my Zoom yep. ability to share the screen right now. Uh, maybe just problem of my computer. I'm sorry about that. So there is no green share screen button? Yeah, we kind of. Back to me. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I find it. It's fine. Um, I will be back soon. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I'm here. I'm Makoje. I'm working at the International Arctic Research Center. I was on the first leg of Mosaic. And I'm going to talk to you about the high scoring effort uh, throughout Mosaic. So there's lots of things to talk about Mosaic, but I just decided to focus just on the high scoring effort on some of the um, very primary results uh, we got from the first leg. I'm going just to have a quick overview of Mosaic, which stands for the Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. And then just introduce generally the high scoring effort on some of the Primary, primary results. Now the ice cream one, one of the gro big cross-cutting effort between three of the team of Mosaic Ecosystem, Ice Physics, and Biogeochemistry team. And I would like to thank uh, the lead coring who were able to uh, make that happen. Ison Fong, Mads Kranskog, Marcel Nicolaos, Kovalev, Robert Rember, as well as the uh, fabulous scoring team of the leg one mosaic who were out every every Monday uh, for four to five hours just getting ice core out of the ice on processing the ice core the two next days. Um, so mosaic is, the goal of mosaic is to have a better understanding of the Arctic and its relationship with global climate. And to do though, the idea was to have the same weekly science schedules week after week throughout the year and being anchored on one of the ice flow on drifting with the ice flow, just following the same ice flow on what is happening throughout the year from the ocean ice and um, atmosphere perspective. And it is the largest expedition in the Arctic. It's a one year drift and there is one icebreaker, the German icebreaker, which is frozen in the ice on drift from Northern Russia, close by the North Pole and will be uh, ejected through the frame straight. And it's a big international effort with 17 nations, more than 16 institutions, 600 scientists, and the logistical budget is about 150 million euros. Um, and this kind of what I was telling you, a mosaic of science, so the idea was really to follow the full evolution of the central Arctic from late fall, where there is some remnant ice, going through the winter when the ice is growing on series, atmospheric deposition on top of the ice, and then the melt throughout the spring and the summer. And both from an atmospheric perspective, from the ice and from the ocean, and above, on a layer above that, trying to understand what was the biogeochemical, biogeochemistry happening within the sea ice, from the ocean, the ice to the atmosphere, as well as the ecosystem. Um, within the sea ice with lots of uh, primary production happening at the bottom of the ice during the, the spring, which are released after in the water column during the summer. On Toulouse, the year was divided in uh, six different lengths. The first one starting mid-September up to mid-December on which I was, um, which was the setup phase plus the two months of, uh, of science. And then every leg after was supposed to be more or less uh, two months give and take uh, ability to for the iceberg carrier on the aircraft to fly to exchange crew on scientists. Um, and so the idea was to what would be better idea than just being having the uh, 
an icebreaker anchor on the ice floor and act like a Lagrangian uh, tracer throughout the Arctic. So we had the polar stern here, and here is um, here's a picture of the flow. So this map is a um, airborne laser scan on IR uh, imagery made by uh, helicopter flight during the, the campaign by uh, Stefan, know more about that and can explain why better. And here we can see that this is the central, here is the polar stern with this big kind of more white area, which was called the fortress, which is higher, thicker on more ridged ice with some uh, remnant ice on the south side, on the north side. On the polar stern is here, so you can see the shape of the board. And most of the science happen within three to 400 meters of the board, uh, with here the meteorological city, the ocean city, and so on. But for the ice coring, we wanted to be further away from the board to have uh, le less light pollution. And we were taking this road going up north. And here on the north, there was a second year ice coring site. And here there was the first year ice coring site. So relatively farther away from the board, about a kilometer away. Um, and the idea behind the ice, core, ice coring was to quantify the biological response as sea ice evolved and understood the linkage with biogeochemical processes within the framework of uh, sea ice evolution. So here is kind of the same picture, kind of from the ice physics perspective, uh, ice coring is part of one of the tasks just to understand what are the, what are the physical properties evolution of sea ice. Uh, but eco, the ecosystem group wanted to know what was doing the, activity, the biological activity and what was the pulse of life within the, the sea ice during, during the same year. Um, Biogeochemical bio group wanted to understand what was the relation between ocean ice and atmosphere. So we all decided at some point just to put all our effort together and to get all the ice core we need within the same uh, in the same vicinity, vicinity to, for comparison purposes. So we end up to have be one of the largest cross-cutting effort between ICE, ECO, and BGC. And then I told, told you we are just going away from the board to the dark side to minimize the light pollution. Um, some, some ecosystem uh, scientists kind of think that at the end of the winter and even during the winter, each photons just counts for uh, photosynthesis processes. Each one will be able to go through the snow on the sea ice may trigger some uh, photosynthesis processes and um, led to uh, algae, algae production at the ice bottom. Um, and overall, that was a big, large logistical effort that happened at the beginning of every week uh, during Mosaic. It was two teams with five, and with each was five people plus one bergard and we're using two snow machines plus three or four sled. So most of the snow machine and sled were used for the ice coring effort, and we are going away from the boat uh, up to a kilometer away, which means also that not really, no other people were able to go more than 500 meters away from the boat uh, until we are coming back. And how the day was happening, we left in the morning at eight, and we were coming back either when we had all the ice core or if one of the team members were getting too cold to keep working outside. Um, and here is kind of the ice coring methodology. Something we are also doing new with Mosaic was we are going to collect 25 ice cores. And for people who've been collecting ice cores, it's just it's a time consuming task. Uh, and we never knew if we were able to be able to collect effectively those 25 ice cores. And between them, there was a usual temperature and sanity core plus the density core, which the three of us help us to constrain ice physics properties within the sea ice. We wanted a stratigraphic core to, under, to look at the ice stratigraphy in, ver in vertical and horizontal scene section. Some of the core were subsample for to follow eight to 10 ecobiological properties. And then there was ice core for trace gas and trace metals as well as nutrient, beryllium, and lots of other properties that was, I cannot list all of them here. And in terms of methodology, uh, we are going to take one temperature ice core, there was 14 ice core, full core to colleagues that were later processes on board, and then 11 of those core were sectioned in the field to minimize brine movement and to, um, 
dominant brain movement and to have uh, better results. And then we had to figure out what was going to be our uh, sectioning method because traditionally uh, the sectioning method between ice and ecosystem are quite different. From ice, we start at the ice surface. We look at the snow and then we cut the ice core every five centimeters all the way to the ice bottom where we add up with the odd length section. While eco ecosystem uh, scientists are more interested in of what's happening in the bottom, what is the primary production uh, on algae forming, so they tend to cut the ice core from the bottom, looking there is five centimeter section of the ice bottom and then a larger uh, section all the way up to the top where they end up with the odd section. And then that was a big brainstorming because people wanted to do from the top, people wanted to do from the bottom. And we end up to find a middle ground to do way better science. The idea was we take the upper half of the ice core and we're going to section with a reference to the ice surface. So every people we are going to have five centimeters section from the ice surface, while the bottom of the ice core we're going to be a reference from the ice bottom or the five centimeters section from the ice bottom and end up with the odd length section in the middle. On doing the same processes for eco, we do 10 centimeters section at the top, two bottom five centimeters section, section at the bottom and 10 centimeter section in between. And that was kind of challenging to do in the field. There is a bit lots of thinking, where is the ice core length, where, where is your ice section, what's the ice section depth of, of each horizon. But at the end, it worked pretty well. Um, we, we've been able to do very comparable uh, sectioning to have comparable um, uh, section and resolute between all, all the teams. So that's going to probably lead to very good uh, science co-production between ice, eco, and BGC. Um, in terms of the ice scoring site, I was telling we are going to be about a kilometer or a kilometer and a half away from the ship, and we have two main ice sites. There was a first year ice site, which was a very long uh, band of, of freshly formed first year ice that we started on one of the sites at 1.5 and move every week. We are moving the two by two meters patch three meters away, and just keep going through, hopefully throughout the third year. At the beginning of the leg five, I think it was 40 centimeters and grew up to 75 centimeters. It's typical for the New York ice and priority ice sampling, while the second year ice site was a big refrozen melt pond with 70 centimeters of fresh water, refrozen fresh water, who grew up to 95 centimeters. And in terms of preliminary results, I don't have much beside ice physical properties. So here on the upper panel, it's all relative to first year ice and the lower is second year ice. On the vertical axis, it's the distance from the ice surface or zero, zero the ice surface down to the ocean. And on the lower part of the panel, it's the same data but plotted with a, with a zero at the ice bottom. And we see the sanity, temperature, density, and bright volume fraction. Between first year and second year ice, the big difference was the first year ice has this very nice C-shaped scientific curve that is very typical from growing first year ice, while second year ice show 70 centimeters of low sanity ice, which correspond to the uh, re refrozen melt pond with increasing sanity at the bottom. Um, as expected, temperature, it gets colder throughout um, as we are going further towards the winter. In terms of density, we are about what we are expecting for, for ice, but in first year ice, we got very low density at the top, which is related to presence of lots of air bubble. And with sanity temporal density, we can just uh, compute the brine volume fraction, which decreases throughout uh, as it's getting colder. And finally, like my last slide, it's about uh, ice microstructure. It is a vertical thin section of first year ice on second year ice. And on the top, you can see the typical first year ice with granular ice on the surface at the top with a couple of air bubble and then columnar ice underneath with very large ice crystal on the skeletal layer at the bottom. While in the second year ice in the refrozen melt pond, we can see these 70 centimeters of refrozen, um, refrozen ice and columnar ice forming underneath with skeletal layer. Um, and what I really 
enjoy on uh, this, the ice cream mosaic. It was really a success story of the leg one. We only missed one sampling event in the secondary ice side due to the storm. It was an awesome mix of science background um, with ecosystem, ice physics, uh, BGC people all working together on trying to find synergies. So great science co-production. I'm really looking forward to keep working with them. Um, so the new ice core methodology we've been developing capture both interface, is comparison between profile and I think that's the way to go for ice core. And definitively I will do it again, going to work in the darkness was really awesome. Um, yeah, thank for your attention. Sorry to have been going a bit over time. Great, thank you so much. Um, does anyone have questions for Mark? Mark, this is this is Jeff Curry from the Department of Transportation. I'm just curious about the technology you're using. Is that a Cipri core system? Yes, uh, we just use a uh, normal Covax ice corer on the uh, battery power drill. <clears throat> and, and that worked well for you? And that works well for us. Um, I would say there was a, lots of the two main core had a very steep learning curve. The first time was quite difficult. But at the end, it went pretty well. And just for information, how well it went, uh, despite the ice growing from 70 to 95 centimeters, after five weeks, it took us about the same time to cause thicker ice than thinner ice at the beginning. Great. So, yeah, that works well. We also use. Um, I forgot to mention, but we also use um, ice fishing tents to protect both the coring group and the people who are sectioning. And that really help to keep people warm uh, on the core to froze within the barrel that lots of people have been encountering in, in cold condition. Great, thanks. Are there other questions? No, I have a quick question. Uh, Mark, so there was a storm that happened in November, but you guys were still able to go to your coring site, even though it had drifted further away. Is that right? Yes, the storm um, breaks the ice floor in half, but luckily it was cold enough and then it's, um, it stopped removing. So we are able to cross the, the lead with as enough refresh and new ice on it. But the condition were tough. That was meaning we are calling on Monday, but every Sunday we had to go out on scouting for for a new way to go to the ice coring. And right now there was, there was a big um, breaking event around Mosaic where currently the two ice coring sites are just really just broken away from the main flow and only helicopter says so only you can access them only by helicopter, right? So ice conditions were quite dynamic and challenging. Yeah, great, thank you. Are there any last questions before we move on? If not, then I'm gonna pass this on over to Nathan who will be leading discussion on the upcoming five-year research plan. Great, thanks Melinda. So yeah, for the next 15 minutes, we wanted to solicit input for the, uh, IR, for the uh, five year Arctic research plan. Um, so Meredith sent some background, just some basic facts, uh, essentially that this is done every five years. And really the goal is to improve uh, how we from the federal agencies can collectively work together uh, to engage in Arctic research. And so uh, Meredith sent uh, a way to contribute ideas through an online form. Uh, we can comment or uh, through the IARPIC page, uh, through the, the Facebook page. Um, um, but also, again, just uh, some basic facts too. Uh, this isn't uh, as a way to, to get funding. This is just to reflect what different federal agencies are doing, what terms they're, uh, what's currently funded uh, or committed to fund for research in the Arctic. Uh, and then by collecting the, the input, we can see 
uh, how we can enhance cooperation between the federal agencies. So uh, we have different mechanisms for, for people to contribute, but we did want to have a, an active uh, discussion with the members uh, present today to see, you know, what is it that you would like to see in the, the five-year research plan. So I just want to open it up to the floor for, for people to uh, begin commenting. And if it is helpful, Nathan, um, I just put up, I have this uh, slide that you kind of, um, with your suggestion for how to break up the conversation. Um, so just something to get people started kind of thinking about the way the plan, um, like what elements might contribute to the plan. And I'm also going to put in the chat uh, the performance elements, um, just so you can maybe reference what's currently in the plan uh, to think to kind of start thinking about what these types of things look like now and how we might, uh, what we might add or shift in the future. And in addition, um, we're keeping things really open. So all types of ideas are welcome. Okay, thanks, Meredith. So yeah, first, um, just a point of discussion would be field work needs. I wasn't sure, Ignatius, if you were planning on speaking, or your, your name popped up on the screen, but if there's something that you would, or uh, someone else would wanna see or speak to for, for field work needs. I wonder if um, any of the modelers might be able to chime in with some thoughts on where model development is headed and what types of observations could support that development. Um, I know there are some groups that are working on higher resolution modeling and new parameterization. So uh, are there field work gaps that we could help facilitate efforts towards? Um. This is Ed Blanchard, and um, I'm going to I'm going to take the modeler's hint uh, to speak up. And um, I, uh, from a modeling perspective, there's quite a bit of exciting work going on uh, with um, modeling the interaction of waves in sea ice and um, flow size distribution. And uh, ISAT two is allowing us to. Uh, get a, a bit of a perspective on how often we might be able to see waves in sea ice, but I think in situ field work in the marginalized zone um, would be pretty critical uh, for that work. Ed, it's Martin Jeffries. Um, what would you say is new in terms of requirements in that regard? that would build on the considerable investment by the Office of Naval Research on ocean surface waves, both in the open ocean and in the ice, um, in the Arctic Ocean, north of Alaska? Um, I Well, I'll, I'll let someone, <laughs> Martin, maybe you can expand more on what the Navy, uh, the field work the Navy's done, but um, I think um, more sort of uh, continuous or transect like measurements of um, uh, of swells uh, going into the ice pack and uh, maybe not just limited to to the very edge of this ice pack but fairly uh, sort of um, into the into the ice pack and I know it's probably a lot harder but it seems that in Antarctica um, this uh, process is a lot more or relatively more common than in the Arctic um, so um, that that would be ideally, uh, I think that'd be a, a pretty good kind of laboratory to to go and investigate this interaction. Uh, thanks. I certainly agree with you about waves in Antarctic ice. I was I was on the Nathaniel B. Palmer many years ago, and um, we witnessed firsthand the 
extensive ice flows around us being pummeled and reduced to rubble 450 kilometers south of the ice edge. It must have been a horrible storm in the South Pacific Ocean. Yes, and um, uh, preliminary ISAT2 observations do um, show that. Um, we, we think that with ISAT2 we can see uh, waves in sea ice uh, quite a bit more in Antarctica than the Arctic. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I, I'd want to add on to that, and I guess it goes to that second bullet for satellite and airborne plans. Um, I think one advantage with ISAT2 is that with six different beams, we have a way of profiling waves in a very different way than in, had done in the past. I know John Heinrichs had looked at using ISAT1 for profiling ocean waves, but the or wave penetration into uh, the sea ice pack. And I think one of the problems he found with ISAT1 was that the with only one laser, it was there was aliasing going on, you know, how to tell the wave direction. Um, and so with ISAT2 having six different beams, I think there's a lot of potential for that for moving forward. Um, that's, that's a great point. Thanks, Nathan. And so I, I guess that does bring me to the, the second point, at least uh, for me speaking from the, the NASA perspective, uh, in terms of satellite and airborne plans for the, the next five years, uh, two of the major things uh, from NASA would be, again, ISAT2 uh, now having launched, data products are available. And for sea ice, these include things like uh, sea ice height, roughness, freeboard, um, and we, are now working on a, a sea ice thickness product, which should be available soon. Alec Petty is uh, leading that. Uh, just had a paper recently accepted for that. So um, that would be uh, one of the uh, main NASA work that's going on. We are looking at doing a potential airborne campaign for further CalVal work, uh, possibly next year. Uh, and so that's, that's what's under works uh, for uh, NASA. Uh, Icebridge is now done, unfortunately, in terms of uh, Arctic airborne plans, but uh, other plans are, are being, I guess, under, under works right now, but uh, nothing too definitive that we could speak of just yet. Uh, but if other uh, people from other agencies want to comment, uh, especially on satellite and airborne plans and, and how these might link to the, the field work or modeling and forecasting, and yeah, I'd be interested to hear, especially what you'd want to hear in the the five-year Arctic plan. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Nathan. Are there are there any plans for additional snowfall measurements? We're certainly going to make use of, you know, ISA two as we as we move toward um, assimilating uh, that type of data more near real time. But that's still a ways down the road. But any any additional if the community as a whole, you know, just like how Mosaic has come together um, with all the nations, you know, if we could have a better sense of the distribution of snowfall, the snow on the ice, that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I agree, Rick. And I, I think uh, Avi is also planning work. Uh, so Stefan, if you want to comment, I think Avi has the snow radar, which should help also uh, get information on, on the snowfall. Um, yeah, I just wanted to chime in. Um, yeah, that's correct. We do fly the Crazes snow radar. Um, I think the same version than the latest on Icebridge uh, on our aircraft. And I mean, we were supposed to be in the field right now, um, but this is obviously canceled. Um, there is plan for a summer airborne campaign for sea ice in Mosaic. Um, which was supposed to be in August, um, but obviously with the situation right now, we do not know uh, whether this is going ahead or not. And else the next spring campaign, so in the March, April timeframe with um, eye sickness, with airborne laser scanner and snow radar is planned for uh, spring 2021. Okay, thanks Stefan. Uh, with 
I think we have a little bit more time, uh, especially with regard to the th third bullet for modeling and forecasting. Um, is there anyone in the, the audience here that would like to, to speak on, on some of these elements? Um, this, this is Walt um, at NSADC. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm not speaking, I guess, directly to the modeling and forecasting, um, but as a general um, comment, I think, you know, looking forward, you know, ISAT2 is, a, is an early example, but there's going to be coming more that, you know, the, the data volumes are going to be getting very large. Um, so, you know, things are going towards cloud uh, computing, cloud data storage, um, and, and even things like machine learning just to distill, you know, the, the volume of data down to make it usable. So th that may be something to think about in terms, you know, you know more broadly in terms of the plan is, is making sure that the agencies are working together um, to kind of get these into place um, so that, you know, we have these tools available and also, you know, so that they are, they're interconnected. Um, you know, NASA is talking about a cloud for their data products, um, but then you know, will those work with NOAA products? Will those work with, you know, model outputs that are being funded by NSF and so forth? Um, so I think that's something that's going to be a, a big factor um, in the next, you know, five to 10 years. Um, so I think that's something worth, um, worth considering. Yeah, thanks, Walt. That's a very good point. Um, I no, on the ISAT2 side, again, you mentioned the data volume is just huge. And we've been working with various agencies such as NOAA and NGA uh, in terms of they do want to see data products, um, but you know, it's, it's helpful if it's in a format or some way that they can use and, and make it more effective. Uh, yeah, on the, the NASA side, we've been spinning up cloud computing resources, but these are internal to, to NASA pretty much only. And so, again, we're, we're starting to hear what these other agencies need. Uh, and that's helpful. I, I, but I'm now seeing, you know, how much of a process it is to get all this spun up to make, uh, you know, large data volumes, uh, you know, widely distributed and, and useful for people from other agencies as well. So yeah, if people want to contribute, uh, you know, either a discussion here or, or on the forum that that would be very useful. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just quickly add to follow up on Nathan in terms of ISET2, um, just to let people know, you know, the, the DAC at NS, the NASA DAC at NSAC is distributing the data and there are subsetting uh, capabilities. So you can reduce your volume quite a bit there, but it's still going to be a challenge going forward. Hey, Martin, did you have a comment too? Oh. Sorry, yes, thanks, Nathan. Um, I don't know what guidance you received from Meredith and Sarah for this discussion. And uh, they may have said um, that ultimately the Arctic research plan that's released cannot be aspirational. It has to be grounded in reality. And that's the reality of agency budgets and activities, some of which are programmed out years ahead. Um, but I would say that at this stage, where we're merely discussing ideas and making suggestions, it's okay to be aspirational. Um, here's an opportunity to get some of those aspirations um, before the agencies and the program managers and their uh, leadership, um, because what you bring up now could become reality, even if it's not currently uh, programmed. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Martin. That's a very good point. Hey, this is this is uh, Betsy again with Arcus and CI's Prediction Network. Um, I'm wondering, oh, I'm, maybe I've missed it, but what what is the deadline for providing input? And it seems to me that with all the disruption last week, especially with uh, COVID-19, that there may be people that would like to be in like an online discussion that missed this opportunity. Um, and I'm I'm wondering if uh, we can help promote. Uh, participation and input in giving feedback to the plan in a better way. It, me and us at Arcus and us at the CS Prediction Network, I'm willing to help out in that way. 
Thanks. I think Meredith is yep. pulling up information about the plan. Do you want to jump in there, Meredith? Thanks. Sure. We're very early, Betsy. Lots of yeah. time. And I, I think that um, that offer to help is really useful and we will need to really re-examine kind of how we're planning to engage with the different communities that we want to draw in in these discussions. Luckily, IRPIC is largely online to begin with, so we have an advantage there. Um, here at the bottom of this page, I sent the link to this earlier in the chat, you'll see um, this handout or a flyer for um, our timeline here. So we are now in, um, fingers crossed, I believe that um, at the very end of March, very beginning of April, we'll, we will be releasing our federal register notice um, and that will be open for 90 days. And that is one way that agencies and individuals, organizations can contribute to the research um, plan. We also um, have this online form um, for comments that we'll be um, putting into our comments spreadsheet. Um, and then the, the plan right now is to host a workshop in September where we bring together kind of key voices um, to take in all of the scoping information that we received in the federal register on what should be included in the plan, put that into a draft plan, and um, then go into a draft writing phase, where then after that, we would um, have a second federal register notice with the intent to release this at the end of 2021. Sarah or Martin, do you have any other thoughts or things to add to that? Yeah, I would just like to add, Meredith, thanks for that overview, that um, in this early engagement phase, which is the 90 days of the Federal Register Notice, we will be holding some webinars. The dates are still need to be um, set for those, and they'll be open to um, uh, communities of interest. Um, so we may try to do some that are more targeted towards social sciences or more towards engineering. That still needs to be worked out. Um, in addition, there are some organizations that are pulling together um, their um, folks within their network um, that will be doing their own scoping workshops. And um, we will, um, if, the, if any of those are open, we'll, we'll make that known. Um, but uh, if anybody here wanted to arrange one in their institution, we would be happy to help with that. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we're out of time for what we had allotted for the discussion on the five-year plan, but yeah, thanks for everyone for your input. I think to, to close the meeting, we just wanted to have some time for, for open discussion. Uh, in particular, one of the items that we mentioned is obviously the impact of, of COVID-19 on, uh, on people here. And if there's a way that the different agencies uh, can, can help contribute in some way, uh, you know, obviously, I think mosaic disruptions are, are one of the, the big things that we're hearing about uh, right now. Um, I guess one other thing I wanted to bring up is from the NASA side, we've been asked uh, for input on, you know, observables from, from COVID-19. Uh, can we see impacts and measure them with, with NASA resources? Um, you know, it's one thing to measure these impacts, but it's, it's another if other agencies could use data like this uh, to uh, to either enhance you know what they're doing or, or some kind of response but yeah I just wanted to we wanted to open it up to, to open discussion for these last few minutes Hi, it's Martin again um, we we've already learned it's been well publicized I think that um, air quality has greatly improved 
um, because of the reduction in economic activity, industrial activity, pollution, etc. And of course, so that changes the radiation balance and the surface energy balance, which um, has an effect on any, any exposed ice and snow in the Arctic and elsewhere. And I wonder if um, there are some NASA data sets that could help in that regard. I'm sure in due course, and maybe already modelers are looking at how to um, model the impact of uh, the reduce of the better air quality, reduced air pollution, and the consequences for snow and ice, whether it's in the Arctic, Antarctic, or um, lower latitudes. Over. Yeah, that's a, a good point, Martin. Um, I, what I've seen so far is uh, measurements being taken on on air quality. Uh, I think from OMI in particular was was one that was brought up. Uh, but I haven't seen that tied to, you know, what impact this would have on ice. So that's a, that's a good point because it, it definitely will. Hi, this is uh, Andy Barrett from National Snow and Ice Data Center. Um, I think one thing that, that we might want to think about as well is the uh, impact of uh, increased load on, on the web and the internet and the number of people hitting servers and things like that. And, how that is affecting um, power consumption. Um, I, I kind of wonder if uh, we're seeing increases in air quality, um, but uh, are, we, are we also seeing an increased demand in, in terms of power consumption and uh, whether we can measure that just by monitoring uh, the usage of servers, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, I guess towards that end, um, and as a further discussion point, uh, are people from other agencies having issues with telework, uh, data access? Uh, I've seen a number of emails going around for, for me uh, asking, you know, are, are people able to telework and do this efficiently? I'm sure you know, not everyone's able to uh, work if, like for me, example, I have kids and it's not always easy, but uh, uh, things like just accessing data or, you know, VPN, things like that, are, are people experiencing issues? And, and again, is there a way that we as a federal agencies can, can work together to alleviate that in some way? Okay, I, I guess not. <laughs> Um, Nathan, these are these. This is Sarah again. These are great questions, and um, I'm mulling over whether there's um, something that um, we can talk about at our um, monthly staff group meetings with the federal program manager. So, um, yeah, definitely things to think about there. I also wanted to note that um, we have uh, agencies can any program manager or if, if you've got somebody from your agency that posts regularly to IRPIC. If you have updates, particularly if you have funded researchers going into the field, updates and um, on revised um, instructions and regulations and so forth, um, go ahead and post those. Uh, both NIH and NSF have already posted, and if you search um, under the tag COVID-19, you'll pull up um, a number of posts with some relevant information for um, folks that are planning to be in the field. The direction that we've gotten from most agencies is that you need to talk to the program manager because a lot of this is on a case-by-case -case basis. Hi, Sarah. This is um, Betsy. And to follow up on that, um, I think a lot of, well, I know the in Alaska, uh, many of the rural communities are very concerned about um, impact of any kind of external visitors. And friends of mine on um, St. Lawrence Island have closed down the island to any external visitors at all. So I'm thinking that um, there's going to be pressure and um, conflict between field research needs and um, people unsure about whether or not their funding is going to be continued if they are encouraged not to have access. And um, I think some kind of quick uh, guidelines from the agencies and assurance that funding will continue and discouraging people from um, visiting rural communities, at least until um, the health concerns have passed, would be pretty useful. Uh, 
Hey, Betsy, this is Roberto Delgado at NSF. I can try to address that from our standpoint. At NSF, at least, we've begun communicating directly with our funded PIs, those who are and who are not supported by our logistics contractor. Um, and so we are ensuring uh, or reassuring the, our research community that we are evaluating all options uh, with respect to postponements and cancellations of the field work that would impact, uh, you know, uh, financial strain on students, postdocs, technicians, and so, uh, again, like, like Sarah said, we are recommending folks to speak directly with us as the program officers uh, regarding what types of options uh, we, can, we can help to facilitate the successful completion of the research, which may include no cost extensions, potential supplements, uh, you know, additional years of, of logistical fieldwork support. It really depends on, on the particular project, but certainly our, our priority is to preserve the safety and health of, of local communities. And I would like to add something that might be helpful on um, currently scheduled April, April 21st, the health and well-being collaboration team is having, they're planning to have a meeting where the state epidemiology department um, and as well as CDC and ANTHC, Alaska Native Tribal Healthcare System are going to be speaking um, from their perspective on guidance for uh, during this time and for remote communities. It's Martin, if I could jump in on a more general note regarding um, internet access and um, using virtual means as we are right now for IARPIC business. Uh, I sent a message out to the Krell researchers just this morning to, to remind them that there are ways to avoid that feeling of isolation when you're subject to mandatory telework and they're probably already using virtual means to talk to family and friends and and make sure everyone is safe and well and of course that extends to using virtual means to maintain contact and collaboration with your colleagues whether it's in your own lab and department or someone outside um, there are many electronic tools uh, to do that and of course that could drive up demand um, for bandwidth and uh, energy use I, I also mentioned in this message that, uh, well, depending on which state you live in, you may be subject to so-called lockdown or shelter in place. And, um, but here in New Hampshire, we're, we're, we're still free to move around outside. And of course, exercise is good for your physical and mental health. So get outside, go for a walk, go for a run, uh, go for a bike ride, take along a friend or friends. You can maintain social distance. And you can discuss that data set, that manuscript, that proposal, that research idea you've always wanted to pursue or, or something. You can get work done while you're outside, um, getting some exercise and enjoying yourself, uh, relieving a little stress. Yeah, thank you, Martin. That's a, a really good point. And I think especially as, you know, this drags on, you know, this could go on for weeks or months, you know, we, we don't really know. And I think maintaining those connections with, with people, with work, you know, it's going to be in a different way, but you know, things like that, I think we're going to have to adjust. So that's, it's very good advice. And Nathan, if I can just add one more thing, um, we are going to be getting the team leads together for all the collaboration teams. And we are going to be encouraging them to think creatively about the use of our web space, as Meredith mentioned, we've been doing this for about five years now. We have a lot of experience with doing pop-up meetings, with holding regular meetings, with um, encouraging people to post information and share. And so we think we kind of have a unique site here for that kind of interaction that um, is less likely to happen because you're not sitting right down the hall from somebody. Um, that you can see on a regular basis. So think of this as your, you know, office space as well. And think about posting, think about asking us if you could have a pop up meeting just to discuss something, we can help with that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sarah. And I, I see Roberto's produce or uh, putting some helpful links and um, ideas up on the chat. So yeah, thanks very much. I think we are out of time. So I don't want to hold people too much after the, the meeting time. But um, yeah, thank you everyone for, for calling in. This is a, a productive meeting. Glad to, to hear all the contributions.
Okay, bye everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.